So I first wrote this talk about a year ago in response to a lot of questions that I was getting. And one thing that has changed a lot in that year since I first delivered this talk is that the documentation for auto instrumentation is a million times better. So before I even start, I just want everyone to give a round of applause for everybody who has contributed to the open telemetry documentation and also all of the maintainers, please. It's awesome, thank you, okay. So let's talk about it, because it's even though the documentation is awesome now, it's still really challenging. There's still a lot of stuff to disambiguate. So let's dive in. So the questions that spawned or, or inspired this talk were these, right? Do I need to modify my application code in order to use auto instrumentation? Will it work no matter what libraries I'm using, or do I need to use specific ones? And will it work if I'm not using Kubernetes? These there were more questions, but these are the ones that came up the most, right? And of course it depends, but uh, that's why we're here to talk about it in depth. So just a quick agenda, right? We're gonna talk about what our goals are with auto instrumentation, why we would even wanna use any of this. And then we're gonna talk about what different kinds of auto instrumentation are available, whether you're in Kubernetes or not, depending on which runtimes and languages you're using. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Kubernetes operator, but I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about that because there are some other great talks about that, like um, Reese's earlier. And finally, we're gonna talk about when auto instrumentation is not enough and what we need to make sure that we're manually annotating even when we're using auto instrumentation. Sound good? Cool. So just a quick definition, just so that we're all on the same page. Instrumentation, this is the process of just translating interesting things. I'm not gonna to be too specific about what those interesting things are because that's gonna depend on you, but it's the process of translating those interesting things into telemetry signals, pretty straightforward. So, uh, kind of an example of what that looks like, right? We have uh, a client and it's making a request. Maybe we have a Node.js backend with the express request handler and instrumentation's job is to look at that happening and say, hey, we need a span, please, right? We're, we're all on the same page here. Okay, so what are those interesting things? Well, if you're talking about open telemetry, most of the time we're talking about requests, right? We're talking about tracing. So it's requests, queries, and messages, things that are happening on the network, but we're interested in that from inside the application, not from the network layer, right? And then we're also interested in errors, exceptions, and events. Those are really interesting to us. And finally, we're interested in not all function calls, because if we had all function calls, that would be profiling, and that's cool, but that's not what this talk is about. But we're interested in some specific function calls with their arguments. That's where we get the application context for these other things. And actually, if you can observe those function calls, or you know, if you, if you can arbitrarily define the function calls that you're interested in, turns out you can capture all of those other things as well. So that's really, functions is really our, our or hook for instrumentation, whether it's automatic or manual. We also need, in addition to those interesting events, right, we need some metadata so that we can make sense of those events. And this metadata sometimes comes directly from the instrumentation, but also the, we're going to enrich our, our signals with some data that might come from some other sources. Some of these sources can be automated, some of them cannot. So the user context is one that really cannot be automated, right? You, you built your application, you know how the user is interacting with it, and you're the only person who can tell your instrumentation, hey, this is the data that I actually wanna capture about my, my users, anonymized, of course, right? Don't store PII in your telemetry, bad idea. And, and more importantly, like, what was the user trying to do? Because that's what you, you're gonna care about when you're on your debugging journey is, what was the user trying to do? And uh, where did we screw up, right? Then you wanna have your infrastructure context. This is great, this is very automatable. We have resource detectors in OpenTelemetry, so you can use resource detectors in your SDKs, in the OpenTelemetry collector, and you can just automatically annotate all of your telemetry with relevant signals from the, the environment that it's running in. And this is very good to automate because you want it to be as consistent as possible. And then finally, and this is maybe aspirational, and if you have questions about this, I encourage you to talk to Hazel because she has lots of really great thoughts about this but organizational context, right? This is sort of like taking observability to the next level. If we can add that metadata of who within our organization is responsible for a specific thing, that's really, really valuable. And we're never ever going to get that automatically. We have to put that in ourselves somehow. But if our organizational context aligns with our infrastructure context, then we can automate that at the infrastructure level, right? If you have teams sharing infrastructure, then you can't do that and you're gonna to have to get into some nittier, grittier annotations. So how does this all work in OpenTelemetry? Well, instrumentation in OpenTelemetry, and here's an example from the Otel demo project, the Node.js front-end service. 
right? We have the SDK and we have the API. We're all very familiar with these. These are the, the things that we put in in order to start generating telemetry. And then on top of that, we have these things called instrumentation libraries. And this is really where auto instrumentation or something that we might call it auto instrumentation starts. And so uh, here's a zoomed in view of that code, right? Enhanced so you can read it better. Um, isn't that auto instrumentation? Like if we look at that in that line uh, 14, it says get node auto instrumentation. So there's the word auto instrumentation. Are we doing auto instrumentation? Isn't that it? Kind of, it's the first start, step, right? Instrumentation libraries give us visibility into these libraries that we're using, which then probably, because we're probably using one of these libraries for things like database calls and HTTP request handlers, right? We didn't write those things ourselves. If you did, we're gonna get to that. Um, so we're probably using these things and having instrumentation libraries that understand what they're doing and can translate that into OpenTelemetry API calls. We're starting to get to automation, right? But this is still inside our code. We still need to add dependencies. So what actually is auto instrumentation? Um, let's disambiguate it a little bit. So we have the instrumentation libraries. To me, that's the first step. And then we have things like that node package that we were looking at, these auto instrumentation meta packages, which can basically observe what's happening inside the same code that they're a part of, and then pull in other dependencies as needed or activate other dependencies as needed, right? That's really cool, but it's still happening inside our code, inside our process. Then we get to no code instrumentation agents and extensions, right? So this is basically any mechanism, and there are a few, and we're gonna talk about them, to observe what's happening inside the code after the code has already been compiled or bundled or shipped in some way, and we no longer have the ability to modify the code or the desire to modify the code. And then we have the instrumentation injection, right? It's great that we can automate this. It's great that we have this no code instrumentation. Injection really with the Kubernetes operator is a way to uh, pump those things into the, right? Do that part automatically so that you don't actually have to modify um, your Docker containers and things like that. Let's answer that first question or one of those questions from the first slide, right? Can I use this without Kubernetes? Yes, you can. You can set environment variables and you can modify your Docker containers and you know, install extensions in your runtime to get no code instrumentation without Kubernetes. The Kubernetes operator just provides a really convenient way to automate doing all of that stuff inside a Kubernetes environment. Okay, so let's talk about the different mechanisms that exist for auto instrumentation. And it gets a little bit hairy here because some of the no-code instrumentation mechanisms are then, right, basically what the no-code instrumentation mechanisms are doing is injecting the SDKs that then depend on these library instrumentation mechanisms. Library instrumentation mechanisms, this is my word for anything where it's running inside the same process, it's another dependency, right, that goes inside your code, but you didn't actually modify the thing that the, that the developers were writing, right? You, you wrote some code that observes what it's happening. So this is kind of similar to like what we heard from the panel before, right? Where you would have maybe some, maybe manual, maybe automatic, but you're gonna have some kind of instrumentation baked into your framework that is opaque to your developers. Okay, so let's talk about, and the no-code instrumentation, right? Of course, as we just defined, is ways to get those SDKs in there without actually modifying the original source code. So the different mechanisms for library instrumentation, we have monkey patching, function wrapping, middleware injection, event observation, we're gonna talk about each one of those. And then in no code instrumentation, we also have monkey patching. So monkey patching is really just, right, like I, there's some code and I wanna replace it with this other code that's slightly different, right? Maybe it includes a new dependency. So you basically just take your whole module and replace it with a new module that has the OpenTelemetry SDK and API and instrumentation libraries as dependencies. Then we're gonna talk about how the runtime agent in Java and .NET do kind of a similar thing, but on the bytecode level. Um, PHP is kind of unique in how it uses the interpreter extension. And then finally, we'll talk a very little bit about doing it uh, with eBPF and syscalls in Golang. So right, we kind of talked about monkey patching. Here's an example of uh, the node instrumentation, and it's monkey patching the router inside Express. So this kind of achieves that slide, that animated slide that we saw um, where we were observing the express HTTP calls. The way that this happens is uh, basically there's this function instrumentation node module definition. And the first few arguments just tell it kind of what libraries and what modules we're targeting. We're targeting the express library greater than version four, less than version five. And then we give it our wrapped version of that module 
that includes this um, sort of rewritten version of the router that is built to emit open telemetry spans for incoming HTTP calls and then to also propagate the context, right? That's another important thing that I didn't really mention, but auto instrumentation, in addition to getting the telemetry out, also has to get the context in to the next thing. Okay, so function wrapping. Here we have an example from PHP. And in PHP, we have the extension, the open telemetry extension for PHP. Once that extension is installed, it provides this hook function that you can then use to hook into specific functions or methods from elsewhere in the PHP. And you basically get this um, callback system where you can say, hey, before the function runs, I want to do this. After the function runs, I want to do this. Right? And so we can use this to set up our context and emit our telemetry. We have middleware injection, no code example here. This looks like, you, you all know what middleware is. You'll know what middleware looks like in your programming language and libraries of choice. So you can just imagine how easy it would be if you could inject some middleware that you could then get telemetry out of that, right? Great. If, if middleware injection is an option, it's usually the, a great option for auto instrumentation. Um, and then we have event observation. So this example comes from the Elixir instrumentation libraries um, for Phoenix which is a framework for Elixir, for those who are not familiar. Um, and so here what we're doing, Phoenix already has this awesome thing, or, or sorry, Elixir has this awesome library called Telemetry, which predates the Open Telemetry project. The naming is really annoying. And uh, the Telemetry library is used in Phoenix. And so basically there are all of these events and metrics that are already being emitted by Phoenix when it's running. And so to auto instrument it, all you have to do is subscribe to those events and then do your relevant telemetry exporting based on them. That's pretty awesome too. Okay, so how do we get these things? This is how we instrument our libraries and we kind of can pick and choose from those methods what is gonna be most appropriate for the library and the language that we're trying to target. How do we actually get that into our code without editing our code? These are the programming languages that support no code instrumentation in open telemetry. A little asterisk there next to go, because last time I checked that was still experimental. I don't know if that's still true, so I might need to, to check on that one. But so we have in Java and in um, .NET and Python, right, there's an agent. The Python agent is kind of weird because Python is an interpreted language, right? Java and .NET are compiled. And so what those agents are doing is running a, um, uh, sorry, they're doing like monkey patching, but like at the bytecode level. Um, JavaScript, it's an interpreted language. The code has, the code's just there. So we can just change the code before it runs. Easy enough. Um, with Go, because Go is, um, compiled all the way down to um, machine code, we don't have any mechanisms that are really good for actually um, getting instrumentation into that before eBPF. But now we have eBPF, and that lets us observe the syscalls so that we can actually understand what's happening inside this compiled binary. There are some gotchas to that. I'll, I'll talk about that. And then uh, we, we talked about the PHP one. Uh, it gets that hook function in through the interpreter extension. Cool. So bytecode injection is a way that, uh, like I mentioned, right, we're doing function wrapping or monkey patching at the bytecode level. What does that mean? Well, it just means there's an extra step, right? We have the source code. The source code get comp gets compiled into bytecode. For those of you who are familiar with bytecode, it's still kind of human readable. And so we can then just have, you know, an agent that sits right there inside the JVM attached to the process that you're trying to observe. It works similarly in .NET and Python, and they can just say, hey, actually, no, that's not the bytecode you're gonna run, this is the bytecode you're gonna run before it gets run, and then we can inject our SDKs. Yay! But we can't do that with compiled binaries because they're compiled, right? So eBPF, which, by the way, doesn't stand for anything anymore, I just learned that, and um, uprobes are a way to um, from inside the kernel, basically write these programs that observe user space functions that are happening. And from that, we can then try to understand if there's some interesting event, right, that we should emit telemetry for. But it gets a little challenging because we don't have complete visibility into what's happening inside the user space. We don't necessarily have all of the names. The memory locations can be dynamic. And so it is hard to do that. Oh, yeah, sorry, this is a diagram of 
how eBPF works, right? You're, you grab, uh, getting all the syscalls basically for a process that you're attached to, and then you can choose which ones of those you want to respond to and run your, your little code in response to. But if we look at this diagram again of how interpreted languages, or sorry, uh, languages with a runtime, like a JVM or um, .NET, we have these extra layers, right, from the machine code, which is where the eBPF and the uprobes would operate, all the way up to the source code. And the source code has the names and the things that we're actually interested in. So it is possible to auto-instrument these things using eBPF. It's just a lot harder, and that's why it hasn't really happened yet. Okay, so I said we could inject the instrumentation with the Kubernetes operator. This is true. Here's a quick example of how to do this. I think this is a little bit out of date. And yesterday at Cloud Native Rejects, Reese and Adriana gave a great talk that goes in depth into like how to actually do this, how to use the open telemetry operator to do auto instrumentation. And I would definitely recommend taking a look at the recording for that. It is up on YouTube. So, okay, have we learned how to answer our questions? Do I need to modify my application code? Probably not. Do I need to use specific libraries? Yes, you need to be using one of those instrumented libraries. Caveat to that is that some of the auto instrumentation agents, like I know this for a fact for the .NET agent, I'm not sure for the other agents, provides some instrumentation that is not provided by those libraries. So if you look at like the contrib library for a specific language, you're gonna see all of the library instrumentations in there. There might be more that are covered by the auto instrumentation agent. And for that, you're gonna have to actually Right now, it's not in the docs. You're just going to have to go ask somebody. Um, Slack is a great place to do that. And will it work without Kubernetes? Yes, we answered that one. Yes, you can use it in Docker. You can use it by just setting environment variables and modifying your runtime. Okay, so when is it not enough? When do we need to do more? Um, really, um, anytime you're crossing an organizational boundary, I would say that is a really good time to emit another stack trace. And you might not be crossing an organizational boundary at the same time that you're crossing a network boundary. So you would have a span, an internal span um, generated. And this can also be useful if you're trying to do performance analysis, right? So if you have specific function calls that are really expensive computationally, that's another good place to add more manual annotation, add more granularity than you're going to get out of the auto instrumentation. Um, you might be using incompatible frameworks or libraries. You might be, you might have rolled your own HTTP library. Good for you. You will uh, have to deal with the instrumentation. Now here, I would say you're not really doing like manual annotation. You don't want to have to go in and annotate every single request handler. So you're just gonna have to build your own auto instrumentation, library instrumentation for the custom library that you built. Um, I think we heard from Airbnb that they had done something like that um, on the panel. And the more monolithic your services are, the more that there is happening inside your service that's not crossing a network boundary that would get picked up by auto instrumentation, the more important this becomes. And then we need to add additional details even when we are at using auto instrumentation. So auto instrumentation is working by injecting the SDK into our programs, which means we then have the OpenTelemetry API available in our code. So even though initially we started using this because we didn't want to modify any of our code, with it available, now we can just go in and put OpenTelemetry API calls and add additional data to the stuff that's getting exported by the auto instrumentation. So that's where we can layer in those user experience and client details that the auto instrumentation doesn't have that we wanted to layer in there. This is where we can layer in stuff that the auto instrumentation doesn't have about lines of business, cost centers, revenue departments, right? Who owns what, who's responsible for what, all of that metadata can get in there. And then um, we talked about this a little bit, right? But if you're using your own custom architecture, or especially if you're not using HTTP and you're using other types of remote procedure calls, um, you're going to notice that your auto instrumentation tr traces are incomplete. And you're gonna have to do a little bit of work to either complete those or rely on something other than tracing for those internal uh, calls. I think I spoke really fast because I feel like I have a lot of time yet left. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to take a quick pause and take a sip of water. <laughs> um, the timer doesn't actually work, so I have no idea how much time I actually have left. But uh... <laughs> Cool. So 
when is auto instrumentation awesome? Well, I would say always, right? But um, especially when we're using it as a starting point to just make sure that we have those SDKs and APIs and that we can, our developers have a really easy path to add the manual annotations that they want without having to think about all of the different dependencies that they might need, right? They can basically just say, okay, I'm gonna count on that the OpenTelemetry API is present and then I can make OpenTelemetry API calls. I don't have to worry about the rest. Um, auto instrumentation is really great for filling gaps in end-to-end -end distributed tracing. Um, this is great, like if you have a legacy service where you just don't want to touch it, uh, yeah, throw some auto instrumentation at it. Um, or if you have a central observability team and maybe you don't have, that, that observability team doesn't have skills to work in the language or you don't wanna like rebuild something and maybe you didn't do it as efficiently as the team that did it, they didn't give you a good build process or something, right? So if you don't have the ability to do the builds, then auto instrumentation is another great option for filling that gap. Um, I also really like it because for me, I like distributed tracing as a way to understand a system that I haven't worked with before because I get an immediate topology. I don't have to count on the documentation being accurate and I don't have to bug a senior developer who is there and who knows. I can just know for a fact, hey, this service depends on this service because I see the HTTP traffic. Cool. And then, right, um, if we have off the shelf components that we don't wanna modify, that's another really good reason to use um, auto instrumentation. Right, so I had a project that involved Jupyter notebooks and we didn't want to go in and like build, make our own build of Jupyter and so we used auto instrumentation and then we could see what was happening with these Jupyter notebooks. Uh, that was pretty cool. So my advice to you would be, uh, if you have any doubts, just try it. Include auto instrumentation. You're not going to lose very much. You might gain more detail than you wanted um, and then you can think about either you know, filtering or sampling or just scaling it back. But start with it and then see, see what you get, see what you need to remove, see what you need to add. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, this is a QR code for the Hotel Pavilion. There'll be folks hanging out there uh, all week. And we're also gonna, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I left some time for some questions. So does anybody have any questions? I see a question over there, yeah. Um, so the question is, what's the value in auto instrumenting like off the shelf software like Jupyter? Um, in that case, it was because it was part of a larger system, right? So instrumenting it gave us the complete, the complete tracing. Um, but it can also be valuable if you're, for example, trying to understand the performance of the system. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, it's, so it's, it varies from runtime to runtime. In Java, it's very efficient. Um, and I know, I think Honeycomb has published some blog posts where they go into the, the specific numbers. I will say like in PHP, the overhead is sometimes not worth it. Um, but in most languages, it's pretty good. Other questions? Yeah. No, the que so the question is, have, we ever, have I ever seen a reason to completely replace auto instrumentation with manual? Just kind of thinking, I have not, but um, thinking of one that might come up, right? If you have a very simple system that is never changing and you want really explicit control over everything, all the telemetry that gets emitted from that, you don't wanna have to deal with dependencies that you might have to update, right? So you could certainly like create a very minimal stable thing uh, ignoring open telemetry, or sorry, auto instrumentation. Yeah. That's a great question, and I completely skipped that in my talk. Thank you for asking that. Auto instrumentation libraries give you tracing. They also give you metrics, and just it's still kind of being built, but they also, to some degree, give you logs. And yes, I would definitely recommend it for those use cases as well. And profiling, yes, thank you. Auto instrumentation is great for profiling. Okay, I think that's about time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>